Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, it seems that we're, all, we're already um, about 20 minutes behind schedule, so uh, we'll be starting right, uh, right ahead. My name is Vasilis Veskoukis, and uh, I'm with the National Technical University of Athens and also Open Knowledge Foundation uh, Greece. Uh, this uh, talk is about, is titled Geoinformation Infrastructures for uh, Aggregation, Visualization and Analysis of uh, Heterogeneous Geospatial Open Data. It's quite a long title. Uh, so it uh, might take some uh, discussion on the title itself. So let us um, say a few words on uh, what this uh, talk is. Uh, well, it's uh, more of, a, of an overview of open technologies uh, which uh, can be used in the development of uh, spatial data friendly, as I call it, the information system and um, a presentation, a conceptual presentation of uh, the relevant software engineering and information system uh, concepts, uh, standards, uh, architectures, and so on. Uh, there will be a very short discussion on, uh, on geospatial application, and clearly this is not a software engineering or information systems um, class, uh, which uh, will um, uh, leads me to ask you, uh, whether you have uh, uh, any experience in uh, software and information systems development so as to better adjust my timing in uh, uh, some topics that I will be addressing. So how many of you have uh, some, uh, any sort of programming and computer science uh, background? Would you mind raising your hand? Okay. So uh, I take it that the rest of you uh, are just um, you know, okay, curious about um, spatial uh, anything, right? Okay, uh, so we'll be discussing uh, and a number of technologies and uh, architectures, and uh, we'll say a few words about the motivation that brought me here. Uh, we started with Babis, uh, with Javier Labos Bratas, a, a few, one or two years ago, I think it was, no, it's one year ago, uh, with a report and for uh, the European Public Sector Information Platform um, about open data in natural, natural hazard uh, management. Uh, after that, uh, I took a sabbatical and I was for uh, one year in uh, ETH uh, Switzerland and in uh, Groningen, the Netherlands, uh, where I had the opportunity to work in a postgraduate program uh, about um, geospatial applications and the geomatics, as they call it, call it, geoinformation systems, where I gave a series of lectures on um, distributed mission critical geospatial applications as you can uh, see on the wall and uh, um, distributed web GIS and linked open data uh, which uh, actually motivated me, motivated me quite a lot in delivering this uh, kind of uh, discussion of a presentation today and also I gave a, a full course in the Netherlands um, titled Geoinformation Applications Development which was a, a, a course addressed to software engineers but focused on geo uh, application uh, development, whatever that might mean. Uh, then I was also involved in some research in, with the ETH uh, guys when there's a paper to be presented in September uh, in Zurich uh, about uh, how to put together the information infrastructures. Uh, th that's when the title came along for, uh, to support in the interdisciplinary risk analysis research. And there's also a presentation uh, that I will be giving a seminar at uh, the Risk Center of ETH in Zurich uh, in October. Uh, I will come to that later if we have uh, time. So the idea about information systems, you know what information si an information system is, uh, but uh, something that makes a geo-information system spatial is uh, spatial is that you need, you don't know, not only do you need an idea and uh, the potential to implement an idea, but you also need data. If you don't have data, you don't have an application, no matter how big, how important the need is and how good your idea or your potential to implement uh, whatever you are supposed to be implementing is. Uh, so that, that's something that makes uh, geoinformation systems very important and very special in a, in a, in a, in a way and uh, brings us definitely to data. And uh, the da data sharing has been um, discussed in Europe, is still being discussed in Europe, and uh, we, to my understanding, we're very, we lag behind, especially the United States and Canada, regarding data sharing and open data. Uh, so uh, I will go through that very quickly, because you, 
we are very familiar, I take it, with open data, what is open data and how important open data uh, is. Uh, to make a long uh, story short, open data is knowledge and uh, knowledge is power, uh, which is a very good reason to open, uh, to, to provide open data and also uh, a very good reason not to offer uh, data as uh, open data. Uh, so you have, uh, uh, by, by using open data, you have the opportunity to, to develop uh, numerous, uh, very large number of geospatial applications, uh, which uh, heavily rely on geospatial uh, data. But this is not a simple thing. Uh, when, you discuss, when you discuss about open data in generally, uh, if it's structured data, the structured data, the traditional data that you used to the before the geo uh, information era uh, then uh, you know more or less uh, that uh, you have a number of problems uh, that uh, take you would take you to the five star uh, okf uh, open data uh, model classification uh, but um, when you want to use open data to develop uh, geospatial applications, there are much more than uh, simple data therapy or some uh, initial data conversion involved. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of standards, a lot of technologies. There are some titles here that I will be discussing uh, a little bit uh, uh, later on. Uh, so we have uh, a, a quite a difficult task uh, if we want to use open data uh, in order to develop some applica any application that aggregates, visualizes, or analyzes uh, open data. Uh, so perhaps you have heard about this title, which is taken from a paper, from a famous paper, very, very much cited paper, or what is special about spatial. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, but the thing is that uh, the unique uh, attributes of geospatial data that makes it different from uh, from uh, traditional uh, structured data, and uh, the thing is that that um, we don't have yet, or uh, I don't know if we will ever have a, a global uh, common uh, understanding of uh, the data ta types uh, that are involved in uh, spatial data. Uh, and uh, how to represent the, the, the various entities that are involved in um, any geospatial uh, application, which takes, which is about geometrical entities, which about uh, events that happens uh, in space and time, and uh, and so on. And uh, as you uh, or probably already can tell, uh, no matter whether you are able to to support such a claim, open data, uh, geospatial data are big data and uh, as anything, as everything happens somewhere, these uh, uh, events, these events create tracks which are actually data that are stored someplace and whatever you're doing uh, does not only create a record in a, in a database containing the, the, the attributes of uh, whatever you, your transaction or, or action you're doing but also uh, data about the location. So, it's uh, big data, it's complex data, and it's hard to, to process and uh, do things with it. Uh, in the beginning, we had GIS, uh, what, was, what were called GIS applications. So if you wanted to develop any kind of uh, a spatial application, you, all you had to do is use a GIS. And the thing with GIS uh, is that they started as uh, desktop uh, applications uh, that um, would do the job on the desktop and uh, with very limited uh, range, um, uh, scope, uh, geographical scope, uh, limited by the, the capacity of the whatever uh, desktop you might uh, have. But uh, clearly this is not the case today. Today you expect that you switch on your computer and you have access to any kind of map uh, globally and uh, the, uh, practically any kind of spatial data you can, you, you expect to be available to your computer uh, simply by being online. So the traditional based JS uh, application uh, are, uh, have a hard time here and they are, to my opinion, already outdated and um, which is what is most important is, is that they can't deal with the distributed and the open, in some cases, nature of uh, spatial data that is available today. Um, 
uh, so you have uh, a lot of kinds of spatial data, as you can see, and um, you have uh, you need to develop and offer services using these spatial data. And uh, I take um, I define by services I, I I define something as a computational process I define as a service, uh, which uh, also to be useful requires some uh, a presentation layer, which today is uh, what we call web-based uh, mapping or applications in general, and also uh, mobile applications that use uh, web technologies for uh, presenting and uh, querying and managing uh, spatial data locally or uh, remotely. So you have uh, a, more, a more complex situation where uh, the traditional uh, GIS uh, software cannot deal with and um, what, where it takes you, it takes you to what is called distributed uh, web uh, GIS. So it's distributed because data comes from many places. You have uh, uh, any, any, any kind of service that you uh, may imagine and it is, if, if, data, if the data is there, it, then it is uh, possible. Uh, and uh, even more, you can um, you can um, make use of a, of a computational model that uh, separates the computations from data. So you have, uh, if somebody has some uh, kind of added value that can value that can be added to spatial data, for example, a routing algorithm, a smart routing algorithm, or whatever, then only this service can be offered, and uh, it it can be offered at a cost, which creates uh, a new business new business uh, models. So if somebody has the data, somebody has the idea of a service, if they, these things can talk together, uh, then another party can in, uh, integrate, aggregate those two things and create what will be called in the SQL, as you will see, a mash-up application. And uh, you have, as I said, unlimited possibilities and business cases. Uh, of course, there are many technical challenges, and uh, I'm not going to be discussing it quite long. Uh, these are a few uh, uh, examples of what can be uh, aggregated and what can be used by anybody as we speak today to create uh, literally any uh, sort of application. As you can see that you can take data practically for, from a any, any service, uh, even uh, Flickr, I, I miss uh, some of uh, some important services, I don't mention them here, but uh, you can take any, any kind of uh, data which has sp spatial reference and you can come up with any kind of idea uh, for a new service and you can offer it to uh, uh, any, any platform, literally any platform, uh, desktop, uh, mobile, uh, wearable or whatever. Uh, so geoformation applications is uh, something much more than uh, software development. It's not, it's not just a special case of software development and uh, even what uh, was called um, a modern in uh, the early 20s or uh, even, e even earlier than that, uh, which is multi-tier applications, architectures, is um, uh, quite outdated when it comes to, uh, to geoinformation applications. So we uh, discuss about infrastructures instead of uh, single information systems. Uh, if you have any kind of experience with gadgets such as uh, smartphones and stuff, you might discover that there are uh, many applications which actually uh, are do something useful for you, but uh, they don't really uh, have any of, uh, of the data that they process, they don't own. Uh, the, the providers of these applications don't really own and store or do anything with those data. They just find them someplace and then pay the royalties and they offer to you uh, the value-added application. And that might be any kind of uh, visualization, any kind of analysis of, of uh, spatial data, and even you can even mission critical applications you may think that can, could be uh, developed using open geospatial data. So, uh, which takes us to uh, the, the main part of this discussion, which is about architectures and technologies for putting together open uh, data, open spatial data for geospatial applications. And you, I, I, I take it that you're familiar with the three-tier model where you have data services and clients and you have several protocols and stuff that 
connect, uh, it are used to connect each other uh, in order to provide any kind of uh, useful uh, service. I won't be uh, taking long on this uh, figure as it might, might take uh, quite some long to discuss, but the thing is that you have different technologies on each tire. You have different technologies on the, the data tier, you have different technologies on uh, the service tier, and you have uh, lots of technologies also on the presentation uh, tier. So if you follow uh, this uh, colorful um, indication here, you can uh, see that we'll be discussing where this slide, what this each slide will be about. So this one is about the technologies in uh, data tier, where we used to uh, relational databases. Okay, I have news. Uh, the relational databases are not uh, as uh, current as they used to be when it comes to uh, spatial data. And the trend is for what is called non-relational databases, where you have uh, some uh, new approaches for organizing and. Um, the presentation tire, uh, you don't have an operating system uh, anymore. The main element, the, main, the, the most important element is not the operating system. Instead, it's some kind of a browser or an object of a browser in, embedded in some uh, application, as is the case with uh, many mobile uh, development uh, platforms. So uh, you have um, client-side scripting, and the client-side scripting uh, concept is about sending some of the computations to be executed on the client, which also might mean that some uh, security considerations uh, might uh, exist, uh, which is uh, what we commonly experience as uh, security holds uh, in operating systems uh, such as uh, Windows, but not only Windows, also, also in browser uh, e ecosystems. Uh, and you have a, a, a few fundamental technologies which are used for data exchanges, and not only for, the, for exchanging data, but also for uh, discussing, for describing, and uh, sending, exchanging parameters, and invoking the, uh, the execution of computational services in, uh, uh, in service providers. So as you all expect, uh, XML is a, very, is a key technology for that. Uh, and it has its own uh, uh, specifics. And, uh, and another one for exchanging data, and it's, which is very common and very, uh, it's open, common, and very useful in, with uh, open spatial data, is called JSON. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and it's just a, a presentation of a record using a string. Uh, and it's very common and it's very uh, popular in uh, 
data exchange uh, of, for spatial uh, data. And when you go to uh, further than the presentation of, uh, of, of the representation of data, but, and you go to the service, uh, how a service should be invoked, what you have is uh, a number of technologies that uh, tell you how how to set up a request uh, and uh, how to execute a service uh, how to get a demand and uh, here is where uh, the, the the nature uh, the marketing the market uh, dimension comes in uh, which means that they are competing uh, technologies similar to one another that do similar stuff uh, but they're completely different and uh, they are part of completely different and competing um, ecosystems uh, which is uh, something against the the, the open uh, data and service philosophy. So uh, one of them uh, is uh, XML RPC. Uh, RPC stands for, for remote procedure uh, call. Another one is uh, similar is SOAP and many other, many, many, many others exist. Uh, SOAP was, has, is, is now open also uh, and it also has that does similar things with uh, XML uh, RPC. Uh, but uh, their implementation, these are all these are implementation details and the thing is that you, to put everything together you need also you need data. So what uh, it takes is um, uh, that you need to uh, comply to, to standards uh, on the messaging and uh, data representation but what happens when you go to the data itself, I mean to the data uh, layer. So uh, there are many developments in the spatial uh, data management uh, area which are about uh, how to represent the spatial data, how to query spatial data and how to integrate spatial data with uh, uh, thematic data which is data that um, fits very well in the traditional um, relational uh, model. Uh, you must be kind of um, familiar with the fact that you can represent uh, spatial data either as what is called a raster, which is a table which uh, that has cells and each cell may have uh, a number of attributes or uh, as a vector, uh, which is more or less a collection of geometries. And uh, if you follow this, uh, this figure, you can see that uh, the features into this uh, area are described as uh, uh, the R stands for, for a road, for example, T1 and 2 stand for three areas and, uh, and so on. Uh, so this is kind of a raster. It's similar to a bitmap, but it's not the same as a bitmap. Or, or uh, sometimes it is, it, is being, it is confused, but it, it's not the case. And on the other hand, we have uh, uh, something that better fits the uh, design uh, philosophy, the, the design domain, which uh, describes the same things uh, with uh, vectors, which are geometric uh, descriptions of whatever entity exists. Uh, there is no a single and an easy answer on, on which is uh, best, uh, because it depends what best is, but the thing is that you take either, uh, either approaching uh, representing uh, spatial data, and of course you have what we call layers, and uh, you're already familiar with that. You have a, a base layer with the maps, which is what uh, have, uh, all of us see when we open uh, an application such as uh, Google Maps or Google uh, Earth or anything. And on top of that, you have many thematic layers. And uh, the, the challenging thing is that data for these layers comes from many different sources, which are uh, distributed, different parties, and uh, also don't necessarily fall, follow or comply to the same standards uh, in terms of uh, technical uh, representation. So uh, to put together everything, uh, no, I'm not uh, staying any longer uh, here. Uh, the thing is that you have, uh, as, I as I mentioned before, to, to, to deal with special data, you may use uh, GIS, but uh, today there are special versions of, uh, of the database management systems of relational and even non-relational, as, uh, relational, as I mentioned, management systems that uh, are called spatial databases that are tuned to efficiently manage the, uh, the new data types of spatial data and to do the indexing and query processing of, uh, of everything. So the idea is 
and the, and, and, and the challenge you know, is what to select in order to uh, to do your whatever you're doing uh, using open uh, technologies for uh, spatial data management. And here is where we come to a very important uh, organization, which is called the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, which is an all commercial organization. Sooner or later, even uh, even uh, developers, even companies that uh, uh, would, in the beginning, would fight strongly fighting against open data and uh, open spatial data and open spatial technologies and stuff. Uh, sooner or later, they, they were forced to join and support the OGC, uh, which uh, is uh, which are now offering standards for uh, data and services. And if you want to develop any kind of uh, geospatial applications, you, it's a very good idea, a very good practice, to my opinion, to comply with OGC standards. And I will come to that into detail in uh, um, in uh, the sequel. Uh, so they have created a, a standards which is called uh, simple features to represent spatial uh, data types in databases and it's about representing features, it is also about indexing, it's about querying and if you take any open source database uh, today you will find some kind of extension th that supports um, the simple features uh, OGC standards. Um, the even further from that, uh, they have uh, they have introduced and they strongly support what is called the web services approach, which is about offering uh, spatial open spatial data using open standards uh, over web services. But these web services, I may, as I mentioned uh, earlier, need to be uh, standardized. So they they need to you need to know what the interface is and how to query uh, such uh, these uh, systems and um, uh, how to use them in general. So you have uh, data standards and you have web uh, service standards uh, offered by the uh, OGC, uh, which give you uh, a guideline on how to, 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 set, to set up and uh, run uh, distributed geospatial web information systems, what I called uh, in geospatial infrastructures. Uh, so, uh, on top, uh, uh, behind everything, uh, underline everything, the underlying technology is uh, XML, and there are some uh, special flavors of XML tailored to the representation of uh, uh, spatial uh, data. One of them is uh, what is called the geography markup language, which is an XML standard, GML, which is an XML standard for uh, represented geographic entities, uh, polygons, line points, and lines, points, and polylines, and stuff, and also uh, enable you to, as I used to, to, to exchange uh, data no matter uh, how they are actually stored uh, in, uh, in the, any kind of uh, database. So you can use, which is a good thing, GML being an XML st kind of standard because you, you can use all the uh, established uh, uh, XML technologies to convert and uh, transform and whatever content to do, do whatever you want. And you, you, it's also easy to, uh, to create something that is easy to represent, uh, uh, to display on, uh, on and render on the browser such as uh, SVG, which stands for Scalable Vector uh, Graphics. I won't go uh, any further. Uh, so you can also use uh, uh, map the OGC simple features standard with GML, which uh, means that you can represent uh, entities stored into a database as uh, you know, compliant to the simple features uh, standard. and. Um, you can uh, exchange, take, and uh, read and write data to that database using GML. Uh, but the most interesting thing about the, uh, the OGC contribution to the open uh, standards and uh, for uh, uh, services for uh, geospatial data are the web st service uh, standards, which is a family of standards for exchanging and discussing on um, using maps, uh, uh, data access, uh, uh, vector data and even uh, services. You can see uh, a, a lot of acronyms starting with W and ending in S 
for example, WMS stands for Web Map Services, one of the most important, uh, WFS for Web Feature Service for Vector Data, and uh, another, uh, 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 several others, WMS, WFS, and WPS, as I will be discussing, are the most uh, important. And the idea is uh, that uh, you have, uh, you have um, OGC compliant servers, uh, servers that offer OGC compliant web services. And if you want to just take a map or read or write uh, a feature or a query or whatever you want to do, uh, you just use a standardized way. So uh, there can be one party offering one map uh, using uh, WMS and anybody can query if they know that they use a, a WMS. Uh, how to use a WMS and query and use the map data to do whatever they want. Um, there are also standards such as KML, which has which became eventually eventually uh, an OGC standards and uh, other stuff. Uh, so uh, the as I said, uh, you have mapping services, feature services, uh, and processing uh, services. Uh, I won't go deep into the details. Uh, that was part of a class that I gave in the Netherlands, and there were also a lot of the implementation the tables, b details. But the idea is that you get uh, to use such uh, a service. You have uh, a way to get the capabilities of the service, to get uh, info or whatever on whatever the service is offering, and finally you can run the service. And uh, uh, depending on uh, how the service is, um, uh, is set up, uh, you get the results into a machine readable uh, standard uh, way such as GML uh, that you can use, take and use uh, on your own uh, way. Uh, that's the generic idea of the workflow of uh, WMS, of the web mapping service. You have a request uh, and uh, the, the web map server uh, does uh, uh, several things uh, internally. It, it has a data source that is not directly visible from the outside uh, and that does uh, whatever the, send, uh, the service specifies in order to uh, finally render an image and give it back uh, to whatever the request is. Uh, you, we are all familiar with the fact that this is definitely an overhead compared to uh, executing the same request directly on the data. But that's the idea of uh, this is a useful and a good thing uh, that we have the overhead. Uh, okay, there's some, some performance issues and, and uh, you know that. But uh, it, it's more important to be compliant to standards and to enable uh, unlimited uh, kind of applications than being a little bit uh, uh, faster. Uh, and there are some several cases that you can get uh, either the, 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 the picture itself from the WMS, or uh, you can do some rendering on your own uh, on the client side, depending on uh, how the, the service is uh, set up. Uh, uh, let us not go into more detail. Uh, something similar happens with uh, web, the web feature uh, service, uh, which is about um, uh, requesting uh, vector data and getting back vector data, which means they are not images, that, but they are geometries. Instead, that you can you take the geometries and then you do whatever you want uh, with these uh, geometries uh, to offer any kind of value added service. And uh, uh, another very important thing is uh, the WPS, the Web Processing Service, which is about uh, uh, executing uh, a computational uh, pieces of code computations on uh, on spatial data or such a service would receive the spatial data that are sent by whoever whatever uh, entity invokes uh, the service and would return back uh, and the, the result in terms of uh, other um, spatial data and any other spatial data representation depending on the nature of the service. Such an example might be, as I said before, um, some kind of smart routing, smart vehicle routing, or a smart uh, guide for a personalized guide for uh, visiting a museum or an archaeological site or whatever. Uh, and last but not least, we have what is called the sensor web enablement, which is a set of standards that support. Um, the sharing of data uh, that is produced from by, by sensors uh, that are literally everywhere and all the time they collect uh, enormous amounts of data 
uh, which um, would, uh, would uh, unleash a huge p potential if uh, they were to be uh, exploited uh, uh, by uh, freely and openly by third uh, parties. So, as I said, the, the web processing service is a very important uh, uh, way for putting together and offering computations instead of data as a service or as a web service over the, the web. You can put in there any kind of algorithm or calculation, or computational model, whatever, uh, and of course you can use your own resources, you need to use your own resources to do that, uh, which would also or might also um, uh, imply that some cost might be it involved, but this is not against the open uh, nature of uh, services and data uh, in general. Uh, I won't be going into further details on how a web uh, uh, processing service uh, might uh, be deployed, but the idea is that several design patterns for putting together many diff different services. So you take this data from one source, another data from another source, another uh, web uh, processing service from somebody else. You put something in, you knew yourself and then you have a new service which can be offered for free or not, or even at a, uh, at a fee or whatever. Uh, that's the idea of uh, um, services that aggregate other services by putting by adding some value, and uh, these uh, kind of uh, uh, business models that uh, are possible today would not be possible uh, without open standards, um, the open standards that, we, uh, that I've been talking uh, so far. Uh, so you can have, uh, as I said, uh, you can take the You create a, a map, you can, you can take a, a satellite the image, some vector data from elsewhere, some uh, population data or uh, whatever, and you can create a new, uh, a new piece of information that makes sense and useful to somebody, which is uh, finally deployed and sent uh, to the end user. Uh, it, it's very important to understand that this is not a common information system. This is this does not uh, literally exist. It's a virtual thing. It, it exists only because somebody uh, has decided to put together and to invoke those services in order to produce an, a new uh, piece of information that is useful in the, in application context or whatever that uh, might be. Uh, so once. For example, if you were to have uh, like a few hours late uh, satellite uh, images, uh, once it would be, it would take a huge investment to achieve something like that, uh, or to pay for to pay for a, sub a subscription in uh, any kind of service in the, that offers satellite uh, images. Today, this is not it, it is not any any anymore that difficult, and you can uh, use any kind of. Um, uh, satellite image or data acquired, even uh, very very fresh uh, and timely data, uh, and put together any kind of new uh, service. Of course, uh, unlimited uh, is only theoretical. Uh, you need to come up with useful stuff if uh, you wanted to survive. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, there are of course unlimited. Uh, there is a limited potential, but uh, also there are several considerations, and there are good, th uh, good things, which is uh, a lot about openness, as you have already discussed, uh, and you will be discussing these days, such as the democracy is actually promoted by such a practice. Uh, but there are several issues, such as quality, such as privacy issues, and generally there is the need for a shift of, uh, of mentality. Uh, so, uh, I want to mention very shortly one very important piece of software as that uh, I've uh, discussed before, which is GeoServer. GeoServer is an open source software, uh, and uh, it uh, offers um, um, a standard a a reference implementation, as they call it, of uh, the OGC standards. So, all you have to do is put together a GeoServer. Uh, uh, installation and you feed 
uh, the, the, the server, you put some data in the server, and this data, without, this data without doing anything more, are available using the open the OGC web services, which is a, a, a huge uh, thing if you think about that. Because uh, discussing a, serve, a standard is a good thing, but implementing a standard is another thing. So if you if we if we were all to to implement the the WMS WFS or whatever standard that would uh, be only a theoretical pot pot potential for most of us, but now with pieces of uh, software such as GeoServer, we don't have to do anything. We take the spatial data, we put it there, and uh, uh, the, this data is being made available uh, using OGC uh, services, web services, without any, any further involvement uh, from our part. Of course, uh, there are several configuration options which are which give us even more potential, but this is not uh, the case uh, here. Uh, so if you Google uh, uh, on the web uh, about GeoServer, we'll find uh, uh, several things. Uh, this is uh, uh, a general, the general architecture where you have any kind of database. Uh, my preferred one is PostGIS because it remains an open source database. It's not a backdoor to Oracle as uh, MySQL has become. Uh, and you have uh, on the application server, the Jewish server, or another piece of software that they offer openly also, which is called the web cache. And um, you can use any technology, not only those supported by this uh, family, which is mostly uh, a JavaScript uh, library called Open Layers to develop the, the user interface, uh, the presentation, whatever you want in the presentation layer. So uh, I will give you a short example of uh, how to use these technologies to develop uh, new uh, applications. And these applications are usually referred to as mashups. I don't know if you, if you are familiar uh, with the term. Uh, but the idea is uh, that you create some kind of a web application uh, that combines services and data from other web uh, applications, from other web uh, pages or sites or uh, web uh, services or whatever. Uh, so you don't need to maintain everything in your uh, on your server. Uh, you just need to to, to structure uh, your application to add some value and combine uh, sources of data and services uh, from elsewhere. Uh, so in the case of geo mashup, uh, you have uh, also some geo uh, reference and, uh, and stuff. Uh, so you can take, uh, as, I, as I said before, maps. Uh, you can take web pages. You can take uh, data that have some uh, spatial reference. Uh, for example, you can think about, uh, okay, you can read uh, the, the, the slide, but you can think about developing a web page that uh, shows on the map uh, pictures, uh, geotag the pictures uploaded on uh, Panoramio or Flickr or whatever uh, to, uh, in a close to real time. So if I take a picture in here and uh, I, I post it on my account on Flickr, then Flickr already offer uh, an API that somebody can use uh, to detect that a picture has been uh, uploaded in uh, this uh, geographical area, and they can produce whatever uh, value-added service that might be using uh, the uploaded picture. Uh, there are several uh, design patterns how to develop uh, mashups, uh, and uh, you can do everything on your own server and uh, put uh, uh, the web browser, uh, let the web, the web browser of the, your clients communicate with your uh, web server, the mashup server only. But you can t also uh, follow other uh, um, patterns that um, have the client also contact the others, uh, other servers directly. Uh, each pattern has advantages and um, uh, disadvantages. Uh, the idea is to integrate uh, base map um, layers and tools and um, anything. Uh, to, and we also, of course, we have to, to, to have some, some decent, some standing, some idea that makes some kind of sense and produces some value. Uh, but uh, when we do that, uh, then we have a huge potential. And um, as you can read on this on the slide, the things that mashups can promote 
uh, public participation is in uh, geographical, in what uh, used to be geographical information systems. So you can use mashups not only to, to deliver uh, data and services, but also to receive uh, feedback from your users, uh, whatever that might be, uh, which is also called the crowd sourcing, as you may already know. And that's where the uh, OGC services uh, come into play and uh, are, can be used in the mashup. Uh, you can take data using uh, the mapping or the feature services and you can uh, use uh, or uh, provide your own uh, tools, computational tools using the, the web processing service. This is a very, very good example of an application called Local Scope. I don't know if you're familiar with that. They don't actually do anything. They, the only thing they do is that they take your position and um, they query a number of sources that have uh, um, geo-referenced uh, uh, data. And you can see, if, if I was in the Netherlands when I did that, that's, that's an example. Uh, they have queried Instagram, and uh, this is what came from Instagram. Uh, they have queried Panoramio, uh, Flickr, Wikipedia, Foursquare, whatever. So uh, just uh, the, the, the value added of uh, actually, uh, how's it called, local scope, uh, is that uh, they did all the stuff for me, all those queries for me, instead of letting me doing something that I would be able to do if I w were to visit every single service, uh, Facebook, Picasa, Wikipedia, Wikimapia, and so on, on my own. Uh, that's a very good example of a mashup. Uh, they don't need to have anything uh, special. They have their agreements so, uh, regarding the use of data, and that's, and that's uh, all uh, there is. And one final thing that I said that I'll be discussing is what is called uh, the sensor web enablement, which, which is about putting uh, the information applications everywhere by using uh, data that comes from sensors. And as you possibly clearly all know, uh, as, uh, um, as the, the smartphone uh, technology advances, uh, every single smartphone is loaded with uh, tens of sensors about practically anything uh, which may give, uh, may produce an information that um, uh, privacy considerations put aside uh, would, uh, might be very useful in a, in, a, in a very big number of applications. So uh, the idea is that OGC has put together a lot of standards which uh, are called uh, SWE, Sensor Web enable, Enablement. Uh, which allow uh, the use, uh, the allow, the allows, allow developers to use uh, any kind of, uh, any piece of data that is produced by sensors uh, and, and uh, similar equipment and create applications and use these data in general. So, um, you can do a lot of stuff, and it, um, every every major player in the in the computer in the industry is coming up uh, with uh, home-related standards to control also things remotely. For example, you can, uh, in, like uh, five or ten years ago, it was a very expensive thing to have something like a smart home, whatever that meant, uh, to be able to, to switch on the light for using your mobile phone. Now it uh, would cost less uh, than a few, uh, than a hundred euros or something uh, to have uh, access from your mobile phone on, uh, on devices at your uh, whatever location of your own home. Uh, so it's a very promising uh, thing and it, it takes any sort of data that, as you can see, uh, that can is produced by any source, so uh, kind of sensor, and another big area that is going to uh, to be huge, and then one of the next big things in the future is uh, uh, health-related uh, applications. Uh, we also have the Internet of Things, which is something very, uh, very similar, actually, uh, a very maybe an equivalent, uh, similar terminology for the, the same uh, thing. Uh, you have uh, everything that is connected to the internet and produces some uh, data or may accept some controlled signaling. Uh, so by putting all this together, you need also, as is the case for simply sharing maps, uh, features and services, um, putting all this together can enable uh, a lot, the hell of a lot, uh, new uh, applications and useful 
I'm not sure about that anyway, uh, services. Uh, so uh, there are sensors everywhere, and the, the, the SWE set of standards allow you to, dis to, to discover these sensors so you, so you can query specific servers uh, for whatever uh, piece of information you may be looking for. You can get information from the sensors. You can uh, assign tasks to sensors if something like that is supported. And you can generally uh, create any kind of value-added application uh, based on that. Uh, so we possibly probably may have a um, dispute on whether it is useful or it's something that would need to be done, especially concerning privacy and uh, the stuff. Uh, but the thing is that uh, technologically speaking, there today SWE is uh, the set of uh, uh, technology standards that enable things to be done. What will be done, uh, by whom will it be controlled, or whatever depends on uh, the, specific of, uh, the specifics of every uh, case. And as you can see here, there are many different players that may be um, waiting to, uh, to develop applications and, and, uh, and stuff that in the past might only be considered as part of a movie script or something like that. Uh, you can, uh, okay, well, I think this can, uh, this, this I'm, the discussion can go a little bit uh, faster. Um, so, uh, to name a few standards, we have um, the observation and measurement OGC standards, the sensor observation service, the sensor modeling language, and the sensor planning services. So, if any of you are involved in any kind of research that relates to sensors and creating measurements, uh, putting together measurements from any kind of uh, uh, source, it might be a good idea to also deliver a service that is compliant to uh, one of these, whatever might be applicable, uh, so as to make this data available on the web uh, for other applications or in any other domain that you have, might, might have not thought about, even thought about, uh, because it definitely might make some sense and it might be um, a very challenging and useful uh, thing. Uh, so there's a few other standards, and I think um, I, I will conclude here. It took me 57 minutes. I think I'm on time. I'm promised uh, something like one hour, right, uh, Babis? Uh, thank you very much. I can take. Um, thank you for your attention. For for many of you, of you it might be, might have been uh, kind of uh, tiring. Uh, I totally understand that, and I will be happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Might have and to provide these slides along with any other sorts of information uh, that you can uh, follow to get to the, the technologies discussed from your own uh, viewpoint and uh, for your own application or whatever you might be doing. Thank you.